Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Why is he telling them don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth? Because they're not going to last. It's not simply that it's the wrong thing to do. It's the stupid thing to do. But Jesus says, turn it around. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Then if you know me, you're going to heaven. Then every day of your life, if your treasures are in heaven, you're getting closer to your treasures instead of moving away from your treasures. He who spends his life moving away from his treasures has reason to despair. He who spends his life moving toward his treasures has reason to rejoice. This life is just a dot. And from that dot, extends a line, and that line is going to go out forever. We all live in the dot, but if we're smart, we're not going to live for the dot. We're going to live for the line with the people of God, God who will live forever, people who will live forever, his word which will live forever. So live your life now while you're in the dot in light of the line, investing in the line, what's going to matter after you die? Randy, thank you. Bro, the dot and the line. Talk Mm. to us about that a little bit. Well, even as we're talking about giving, we're talking about as we live in the dot, this short life here on earth. And I mean, if you live well into your 90s, it's still very short. Like, what percentage of the total time that you will live ahead from now on will this life be? Well, uh, ultimately, it'll be way less than one billionth, and it'll keep getting smaller percentage-wise, right? So in other words, it's really short-sighted just to be living for that dot that we live in right now. But God would have us to take a, an eternal perspective that looks beyond the dot to the line where we're going to spend eternity with Christ. So now, in this life, let's do things that will matter forever in the line. So when we give, for instance, to feed hungry people, and we give to get the gospel to people, we give to get scriptures to people in their heart language, which we as a church do and some of you as individuals do as well to these various ministries well then what we're doing is we're doing we're giving to something that is going to truly count for eternity so giving is a way of moving the treasures from this life to the next life so that one day we're going to sit at these great banquet tables in the resurrection and we're going to eat and drink together. And Jesus repeatedly said we're going to do that. And when that time comes, we're going to have the privilege of thanking people who did so much for us and invested in our lives. And then we're going to have the overwhelming privilege, I think it's going to stun us, of having people come to us and say, thank you for giving. When you gave to Good Shepherd Community Church... This is how it affected me. When you gave in that special Mm -hmm. missions Mm -hmm. offering, Mm -hmm. this is how it affected me. In some cases, it literally saved lives, and in other cases, it got people the gospel. The good news of great joy. Wow. Well, Randy, we were in 2 Corinthians 8 last night, and we wanted to get 2 Corinthians 9, so I know you've got some things to get us there. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with uh, what Jesus said in Luke 6.38 because it ties straight in to what we're going to hit in 2 Corinthians 9. He said in verse um, 38 of Luke 6, Jesus said, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Give, and it will be given you. Now, 
people take that out of context, health and wealth gospel, all that kind of thing. But remember, some people may abuse the passage, but Jesus actually said it. Give and it will be given to you. And the problem with health and wealth gospel is it gets it wrong on the purpose that God gives more back to you because it assumes God's going to give more back to you so you can keep it. And we see that same thing in 2 Corinthians 9. If you pick up in, let's see, what verse, maybe about verse um, 6. And by the way, the stuff we're skipping over at the end of 2 Corinthians 8, if you, if you weren't here last night, you don't really know what I'm talking about. But if you, uh, if you go back and read 2 Corinthians 8, and we got maybe halfway through the chapter, whatever, there's some great stuff at the end of 2 Corinthians 8 that still relates to giving and the care with which uh, churches uh, should, you know, handle God's money and be sure that they're doing what's right, not only in God's sight, but in man's sight. And I, I'm so grateful that our church is very careful with the finances and who has access to them. And there's double checking and there's all of these built in mm -hmm. uh, accountability factors. And Randy, let me interrupt yeah. for a second. Uh, if you did miss last night, uh, it's already online. You can watch what took place last night. So that's available to you. So somebody's going to, like, take their smartphone like right, right now, now address it yeah. at this moment? Well, you know, we are time sensitive, so we do need to do it. <laughs> if you're a multitasker, and yes. But, uh, and I appreciate that, by the way. Uh, and thanks to the film crew yeah. and the sound people and all, all the things that get done all the time. And you talk about eternal reward. Yeah. Um, I, I always think about people in the sound booth who only get looked at at those moments when something goes wrong with the sound. Right. Nobody's going, oh, thanks for that. Oh, great. oh yeah. that sound is so good. <laughs> Thank you so much. And then as soon as it goes bad, whoa, you know. <laughs> Thank you, sound people <laughs> and video people. So you're talking about the end of eight, the portions we didn't catch. Uh, right. And same thing, beginning of nine. There's some great stuff in there. So, I mean, this is all the word of God. So you sometimes feel... Uh, you, you don't want to minimize any of it. But skipping to verse 6 of chapter 9. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. You see how that connects with Jesus? Give and it will be given to you. So, you know, if you're, the, the plant, giving is planting. And so sowing is planting, sowing sparingly. If you don't plant much, you're not going to harvest much. I mean, all farmers know that, right? But if you plant a lot, you'll harvest a lot. So when you give, it will come back in many ways. So the, the, that, even that, that phrase, largely a secular one, what goes around comes around, has a certain biblical mm -hmm base to it. Again, the question is, why did God build that into, build that into his universe? You know, why, why is it that way? Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Now, I think this is very relieving here because we often think in terms of the compulsion, what we're commanded. Now, God does indeed command us to give. Don't, we'll not minimize that at all. But the Old Testament, and we'll see this, is full of free will offerings, just as the New Testament is. It wasn't always mandatory. Yes, there was the mandatory giving, the tithing uh, aspect of things. But he's saying this special offering for the saints in Jerusalem that he's talking about, uh, you know, do, do what you decide to do. Don't do it reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, a happy giver. He wants us to give happily. And here's the thing. We will not give happily unless we get it, unless we realize that we're passing on to others the grace of God, the pass it forward thing. Again, even in secular society, there's a certain... Um, concepts that are biblical in nature that people get. You, you see this with, um, uh, 
with, with Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. How many of you have ever seen those um, PBS shows where Gates and Buffett, two of the wealthiest people in the world, are going on and on, and they just get, some of you seen them, they, they just get giddy about giving. And I remember Warren Buffett looking into the camera and saying, all those years I wondered why these billions of dollars were coming to me, and now I know it's so I can give it away. And his eyes are lighting up, and I go, these are not followers of Jesus, but by God's common grace, they're getting something. They're understanding something. The joy of giving. And God doesn't just limit that to believers. He makes it available to unbelievers as well. But of all people, we don't just have the common grace of God. We have the special grace of God if we know Jesus. And 2 Corinthians 8, 9, that we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich yet for our sakes, he became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. That should be so real and life-changing to us. So this should make us willing and even eager givers like those Macedonians who who pleaded for the privilege of being able to give. That's what God wants. Now, the balance of that is God loves a cheerful giver. Does that mean you should wait until you feel cheerful about it to ever give? <laughs> well, here's the thing. Don't hold your breath. I mean, because it, it, it's going to be a long wait. But once you start doing it, then it gets a grip on you. And you, once you see the joy in it, and I just want to encourage people maybe who have been giving for years. I talked to somebody last night who said this. You know, I, I've been giving for years, but I, I really don't feel a joy in it. And I would just encourage you, meditate on Scripture and connect this with what God is saying. We should, our hearts should be full of thanksgiving and joy and gratitude and giving should be an expression of hearts that are so touched by the Holy Spirit of God. The lightning of God's grace has struck and the thunder of our giving comes out of that. So do what you can, if you haven't had a joy in giving, to mentally and before God say, God, pray, ask God, give me the joy that I'm supposed to have in giving. Because you're really, really missing out. Now, others are missing out because they're not giving at all. And it's pretty consistent across the country that 40-some percent of people uh, who are regularly part of local churches do not give at all. And many give just minimally. And the thing about that is that sometimes we look at that and we say, that's really too bad because... Think of what we could do in the world for the kingdom of God and what more we could do in missions. And that's very true. And what more could be done in the local church. All true. But that's really not my emphasis this weekend. And I don't, it's not the emphasis of this passage here. I think another way to look at it is how those 40% of the people that give nothing and then another 20, 30% who give nearly nothing what they're missing out on. That's the, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's the joy of following Christ and experiencing his grace and depending on him and breaking the back of materialism. There's only one way to break the back of materialism and its hold on our lives. That's to give. You know, How Randy, else do you do it? It's like with our short-term missions, we have numbers of men who have given up their yearly vacation, great personal financial cost, all kinds of arrangements, and we have them back up on this platform. We've said thank you for the sacrifice, and they laugh at us. Yes. And they go, there was no sacrifice. Yeah. It was joy. Yeah. I got to be there when God worked. <laughs> sacrifice? I don't think so. I'll never forget uh, a message that uh, David Livingston, uh, the great missionary to Africa, gave. I actually wasn't present. I read the message. <laughs> um, <laughs> Randy does get around. I, that's yes, that's right. <laughs> Yeah. The time travel thing. Is, yeah, you know, it's good. I'll share that in another yeah. service. But That's another weekend. Yeah. But anyway, uh, here's this guy, and he was, he was asked a question about sacrifice and all the sacrifices you made and going to Africa. And, and in those days, going to Africa was a huge sacrifice. And, and he got up there, and he said, you know, in all the time that I was there and all the things that I was able to do, 
and the joy that it brought me. And then he finished his message, and I believe it was to a group at maybe Oxford or Cambridge, or maybe it was Princeton or Yale, and he said, his, his final words were, I never made a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And what he meant was that the joy completely outweighed it. Um, and so here it is, um, even uh, skipping forward to verse 10. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, God supplies it all, will also supply and increase your store of seed. Again, it's God given, it will be given to you. You'll get more seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. And now, verse 11, you will be made rich in every way. And in the context, he's clearly talking about finances. Yes, it goes beyond that. There's a richness of the soul that comes in giving. But God will be generous to those who are generous. But then he says, you will be made rich in every way so that. Those words so that are absolutely key. So that what? And you could fill in the blank. Health and wealth gospel would fill it in. So that you can live in the finest houses and, and have multiple houses and the and the, the best lands and the largest amount of property and drive the nicest cars and all that. None of that to put down on nice houses and, and, and nice cars and all of that. The point is, in health and wealth gospel, that's where the emphasis is. But what does, how does Paul finish the sentence? This is huge. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You will be made rich in every way. So that, why? Why has God provided you with abundance? So that you can be generous on every occasion. If you've ever wondered why God has given you so much, it's so that you can be generous on every occasion. And then he says, through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. It's not only that you make God happy when you give, well done, my good and faithful servant, pleasing God. It's not just that you make yourself happy when you give. Jesus said, Acts 20, 35, it is more happy making to give than to receive. It's that you make others happy when you give. Everybody wins. What's the downside? I mean, who comes out behind when we give? Everyone comes out ahead. So that you can be generous on every occasion through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And then he says, this service, and the service is the giving, that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Thanks. We worship God when we thank him. We live in a culture of entitlement. And we as Christians live, you know, we sometimes accuse other people of having a sense of entitlement, and we can, we can think that same way. It's mine. And when you think you're entitled to something, you're never grateful for it. You know? But if you think you don't deserve it, and by the way, if you think that, you're absolutely right, what we deserve is hell. Okay? In a word, a four-letter word, what we deserve is hell. If we get that, then even what we would call a bad day pales in comparison to what we deserve. So when we ask somebody, how are you doing? And they say, better than I deserve. That's actually a very biblical comment. So we should be grateful for anything that's not eternal hell. But then when we see wonderful blessings in our life to give thanks to God for, we, our heart should overflow with gratitude, thanks to God. And so then he says, uh, by the, this uh, service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. Now, obedience does come into it. It's not just give if you feel like. So sometimes you think it's saying that, but that's one way to look at it. And then there is obedience, too, that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. So you say you believe in the gospel of great joy, the good news of great joy? Show it. Show it. 
How do you show it? Well, there's a number of ways we show it. It's not only giving, but in this passage, that's what it's talking about. You show it as you give. You show your love for Jesus, that the gospel has transformed you. Your generosity and sharing with them, with everyone else, and in their prayers, verse 14, for you, their hearts will go out to you. The bonding that happens between people when we give to them in their time of need. Their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Grace. He's never departed from the subject of grace. The grace of God is inseparable, should be inseparable from our giving. It's the lightning that produces the thunder. And you know what? If there's no thunder in your life, it suggests that you're not experiencing the lightning. God's grace. And it's like, forgive as Christ has forgiven you. I can't forgive that person. Kind of suggests that maybe you're out of touch with how God has forgiven you. If I can't give and I can't find joy in giving, then somehow I'm missing out on what the grace of God really, really means. The surpassing grace God has given you. And then he ends up, verse 15, saying, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And what is that indescribable gift? Jesus mm -hmm. himself. God didn't send an angel to, to us. An angel wouldn't have been enough. He sent his only son, and Jesus willingly came for the joy set before him to pay the price for our sins. What a, that should transform us. And again, said it last night, we'll say it again. I just know there are numbers of people in this room that do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you know what? I just, if you put your faith in Him and you experience the lightning of His grace in your life, the thunder is going to come. Randy, actually, right here, um, would you lead us in prayer and extend an, off, an offer to souls in this room mm. who step from death to life right now. Mm. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would speak to hearts right now. You know every heart. Many of these people know you. They have a relationship with you. Some of those that have a relationship with you have stepped away from you. I pray that you would convict each of us for sin in our lives and bring us to repentance. But for those who do not know you, maybe they've come to church Maybe they regularly come to church, but they do not know you. They have not placed their faith in you. Pray right now that you would do what we cannot do. Mm -hmm. Speak to their hearts. Move them to pray a prayer such as this. Lord, I confess to you that I am a sinner. I know that my sins cause me to deserve hell. I know I don't deserve heaven but I ask you to forgive me of my sins and I put my faith in Jesus Christ and his work for me on the cross, that he died for my sins and Lord, I ask you to make me a new creation in Christ. I pray that, Lord, that the lightning of your grace would strike in my life and that I would be a new creature in Christ and that you would bring the response, the thunder in my life as a result of the lightning of your grace this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Randy. Let me shift our focus. Um, your book's on heaven, and by the way, one of them we have available in the lobby this weekend, Everything You've Always Wanted to Know About Heaven. It's kind of a Reader's Digest version of, of the larger works that you've done. Over two million copies of your books on heaven around the world. Multiple languages, Chinese, Indonesian, Russian, Nepali, um, how does what we know or come to know and believe about heaven have to do with giving? Well, you know, the, uh, the video um, that, uh, that, that you saw and the audio that accompanied it uh, is, is really based on Matthew 6, and this is probably the, the best way that I know to try to answer that question. If you turn to Matthew chapter 6, please do that. 
Matthew chapter 6 and verses 19 through 21, and look at what it says there. Jesus said, and this was in the video, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Well, you were just asking a question about heaven. And how does heaven relate to giving? Well, Jesus says, in giving, you store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Well, if you don't know what heaven means, or if heaven seems boring to you, or if heaven doesn't seem real to you, and you don't understand the resurrection, you don't understand that God promises eternal life in a new heavens and a new earth, a new universe redeemed by the blood of Christ. Romans 8 talks about that. And Revelation 21 and 22 talk about if heaven's not real to you, then when Jesus says, store for yourself treasures in heaven, it's like, well, no, earth is real to me. So I'll store up for myself treasures on earth, the only place that's real to me. Because heaven, pie in the sky, by and by, you know, that old phrase. And heaven seems like it's going to be boring. And this is my one chance to live here. And I got this bucket list, see. And why would you have a bucket list? Well, you have a bucket list if this is your only chance to ever do anything great, wonderful, and enjoyable. Now, I get it that some of us have certain things we'd like to do before we die. I'm not saying that that's wrong. But don't get the idea that you won't have any opportunity to do anything after you die. Most of your life, it's called eternal life for a reason, is still going to be ahead of you, like we've said. And it's going to be ahead of us in real physical bodies where we'll eat and drink. The favorite food that you'll ever have is very likely a food you haven't yet tasted. You know, the very favorite place for you to visit is very likely a place you've never been yet. It might not even be in this solar system, by the way, for all I know. Because it's a new heavens and a new earth. A new universe, new star systems, new galaxies, new, all redeemed by the blood of Christ. And, it, and if you think, wow, does that blow your mind? It should. It's what scripture teaches us. So if heaven becomes real to us, then all of a sudden our attitude toward giving, well, right now we might say, well, why would I give? Well, why wouldn't you give? If you can store for yourself treasures in heaven, where you'll be for eternity, instead of on this present earth under the curse, where you're going to be here for a very short time, why would you do that? I mean, it, it's like, uh, like if, if you were on a, a plane flight going somewhere, would you like bring curtains to hang across the, the, the window and, and kind of spend all your time? I'm just going to set it up here. No, no because, you know, it's going to be a short time. Now, of course, I don't mean there's no place for aesthetics, and I don't mean there's no place for enjoying life and, and different things that we have in this life. But if you're smart, you're going to lay up treasures where they're going to last. And notice Jesus said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. And you think, oh, he's against treasures, and he's against storing up th those treasures for yourself. Right? Wrong. Because he turns right around and says, store up for yourselves treasures. Just stop storing them up in the wrong place and start storing them up in the right place. And the right place is where they're going to bring most honor and glory to God, most help to other people, and most good to you. I was watching an interview that you were doing with a former Seattle Seahawk, Todd Peterson. He mm -hmm. was a place kicker for years with the Seahawks. His statement on these truths to you in this visit was, what we ultimately will have is what we give. Mm. What we ultimately will have is what we give because we truly can't take it with us, but we can send it on ahead is what Jesus is saying. Exactly. And my book, The Treasure Principle, that's, that's the key theme of what is the treasure principle where it's what Jesus is saying. You can't take it with you, but 
you can send it on ahead where it will be waiting for you. And as, as I was saying in, in the video, if you're living your life with your tr primary treasures here on earth, every day that goes by, you're moving away from those treasures. And that's, there's something sad about that. But if you've, you're through your giving, and through the life that you live, you're living for the line, not the dot. You're storing up your treasures in heaven. Then every day of your life, instead of moving away from your treasures, if your treasures are here, you're moving toward your treasures. It makes, in terms of joy, it makes all the difference in the world. Randy, talk to us about uh, our brothers and sisters in the first century, the early church. Mm. And uh, what do we learn from the book of Acts? You know, look at, uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Uh, here is a, a very powerful passage that tells you what it was like in the early church. Look at verse 32 and following. It says, now remember, the Holy Spirit has just come and uh, Peter has preached this first great sermon. And here they are all assembled together. Verse 32 of chapter 4 of Acts. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything that they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and, get this, much grace was upon them. How is much grace shown? How, how do you measure grace in a group of people? Well, the primary way is through their giving. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. By the way, not for the apostles to keep but to distribute, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. And then it gives a specific example, and praise God for the examples in Scripture and the examples we can look at in, in our lives of giving. R.G. Letourneau was a huge inspiration to me, a man who gave away 90% of uh, the profits, not only 90% not only, uh, of his salary, but 90% of the profits from the company that he founded, uh, great earth-moving machines, um, but who, who saw the grace of God in his life manifested in this gift of giving. And when he gave away that 90%, he said, I shovel it out, the word shovel had special meaning to him because he invented these giant earth movers, these giant shovels. He said, I shovel it out and God shovels it back, but God has a bigger shovel. <laughs> I can't keep up with it. It keeps coming back in, so he kept giving more away. The testimony of that man had a huge impact on me as a young Christian as I read about it. And I thought, Lord, someday I would like to be able to yeah. to give away 90% or more of what comes in. I leave that to you, but by God's grace, there are many people in the world, many people in the world who actually have had that joy and that experience. And I would encourage you to say, if God, now not everybody in this room is wealthy. We're all wealthy by international standards, all, all of us. But there are many wealthy people who God has entrusted this wealth to and the greatest joy in their life to just keep giving, keep giving it. And that's what you saw in the early church. And there's this, here's a specific example, and I know many people like that. Joseph, verse 36, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And it's like there's a man you can trust because 
He's not storing up his treasures on earth. He's storing up his treasures in heaven. And by the way, it doesn't mean that these people who sold lands and houses then had nothing left to live on. In most cases, they did have something left to live on. It's not always giving, it's not usually giving it all away, but it's saying, Lord, you've given me so much. I want to have the joy now of helping other people. That's the way the early church was. Now, some people say, oh, that was the early church. Of course, that was a different culture. That was a different place. You know what? (laughs) The people of God are the people of God. This pertains as much to us as it did the early church. Now, it doesn't mean that we're doing communal living. This is not socialism. Socialism is a, a mandatory giving up of your possessions to equalize that usually has a system in which the people at the top prosper because of your supposedly sharing your wealth with others, only they get it. Okay, this is, this is not what the Bible's talking about. The Bible is talking about voluntarily having your heart moved to care for truly needy people in the body of Christ and in the world And we're even to use our discernment about who's truly needy and who isn't. We see that in the book of 1 Timothy. Randy, in your first book on this subject, Money, Possessions, and Eternity, um, you made a statement in here that says that tithing uh, is uh, is like the training wheels of giving. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, when we talk about uh, tithing, uh, a tithe just means to give uh, 10%. Uh, of your income, uh, one of the the primary passages that people will look at is Malachi 3, and probably more sermons have been preached uh, from Malachi 3 in terms of of tithing than any other passage. If you look at Malachi 3 and turn to, um, well, let's pick it up in verse 7. Let's go back to verse 6. Um, no, let's go to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. No. Uh, <laughs> I was right. hoping for Revelation there we 22. Go. Yeah. Yeah. Revelation, uh, or rather, uh, Malachi 3, um, verse 6. I, the Lord God, do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord. Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Great question, and God answers it. How can we get right with God spiritually if we, maybe we know him, but we've really lost our sense of priority of the kingdom of God and our love for him? You know, how how are we to return? And God comes right down to it, and he comes to money and giving. He says, will a man rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how do we rob you? Lord, I haven't robbed you, what do you mean? And here's his answer. In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. They've withheld the tithes and the free will offerings. Bring the whole tithe, verse 10, into the storehouse. That, and what's your purpose? To honor God and obey God? Of course that's your purpose, but it's not the only thing that happens. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And God doesn't need that food. God isn't hungry. Test me in this, says the Lord. Do you know that giving to God is virtually the only time that you ever see in Scripture, perhaps it truly is the only time, where God says, test me in something. He, he doesn't say, um, do not commit adultery, test me in this, and see whether that works out for you. No, he just says, do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Not test me in this to see if it's okay. But he does say, test me in this. And it's like he's saying, give it a chance. And it's so sad that so many people haven't given it a chance. 
Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your field will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. And there's so much that this passage goes on to say, but just leaving it right there. Tithing, according to the Apostle Paul, when he says that the law in Galatians, he says the law is, was a tutor to bring us to Christ. The law isn't bad, it's good. Tithing was part of the law. How was tithing a, a tutor? Well, I think uh, it, it was just this thing that I've called the training wheels of giving. Because if you give 10% and you start there, you go 10% of the income, that's what the tithe was. And there were three different tithes in Israel, but some of them related to taxation. But let's just take the tithe that corresponded to giving to the priests and the Levites, which were the spiritual leaders. That would be the closest equivalent that we would have to giving to the local church. All right? That 10% can become for you a habit. It, it, the, the, the brushing of the teeth that you get accustomed to and it becomes a habit. It can become the training wheels of giving to get you up on the bicycle. And once you're up on the bicycle of giving, you don't need the tithe. You look back and, yeah, I used to have training wheels. But now, okay, the tithe, that's a given. That, that belongs to God, and I always give it to him. And beyond the tithe, I do the free will offering. And that's what I get most excited. But yeah, I'm excited about the tithe. That's a form of giving too. But because it belongs to God, and I'd be robbing him if I didn't give it to him. Well, then there's the free will offerings, and I give them, and I have great joy. But what's so interesting to me, there are whole, there's an entire anti-tithing movement. There, there are whole websites that are written by Christians, and they're all about grace giving, and they all say it's legalism to talk about the tithe. And a lot of people get listed there, and I'm one of them. Uh, as, as these legalistic people that teach tithing, I go, well, clearly they haven't read my books or listened to me talk about it because actually to me tithing is like, well, it's, good, it's a good place to start, but don't end there. Free will offering. Well, what I say to those people is, okay, let's say you're right. Let's say the Old Testament tithe has no relevance to people in the New Testament. All right. What does this passage say in terms of robbing God? You're robbing God by withholding what? Verse 9. Tithes and offerings. Free will offerings. We can rob God by withholding free will offerings which he wants us to give. So, if tithing is irrelevant... I don't think it is irrelevant. I think it's the training wheels to get us going. But even if it is irrelevant, is our free will offerings irrelevant to the New Testament church? No. And what people call grace giving, and I've had some fairly animated discussions with <laughs> these people, but what people call grace giving, what I usually say to them is, I said, you know, what you call grace giving, the average American Christian living in the wealthiest society in human history, gives 2.5% of their income away. That's grace. That's what you're calling grace giving. How's that working for you? Because what you call grace giving, 2.5%, that is one-fourth of the giving that was required in just one of the tithes of relatively poor people in ancient Israel, and what you're calling grace is one-fourth of that? Don't call it grace-giving. It's an insult to call it grace-giving. In the early church, they didn't have to talk about the tithe. When you're selling your possessions and giving to the poor and you're doing all this, you don't have to look back at the tithe because... 
It's more than that. And for us to be just a small fraction of it suggests it's not just that we're not getting Malachi 3. Forget, well, I'm not going to say forget Malachi 3. It's the word of God. But look at 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and the whole New Testament and what Jesus said and ask yourself, seriously? Will I be able to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and say to the Lord, if God says to me, you know, you gave like 2.5%, that's just average, okay? And by the way, all the people that are giving away the 90%, they bring that average up to 2.5%. Okay, you get that? I mean, the people who are giving 10% bring that average way up. Okay, so the 2.5%, really, how, I don't, it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is the audience of one. How is that going to fly at the judgment seat of Christ? Oh, Lord, uh, I believed in grace giving, so I gave one-fourth of what poor people were required to give under the law. Grace doesn't lower the bar of loving and serving God. It raises the bar. When you're infused by grace, it increases your giving, not decreases. Randy, when, um, you know, during the 80s, while you were still on our pastoral team, and we are... We were in what we call the North. It was just the only auditorium we had. We didn't call it the North. Um, the sermon series that, you know, caused you to begin studying God's Word. Um, there is something in here that happened in that message, one of your messages, that Theda and I are sitting in that auditorium. And it's called uh, Profiles of Christians Who Rob God. Mm. And uh, if I... I'm recalling, because we've shared it a few times, there was like 10 different examples. And here we were just sitting in the church service like everybody else, and they were real stories, just names mm -hmm. changed. And they're saying, well, these people use this money for this, and they don't think about the Lord. And inside, we're going, who's doing that? I mean, what's up with that? And then he kept going, and he kept going. And what we were doing at that point is uh, I was going to seminary, uh, we had a couple children at that point. I was substitute teaching. Um, we had several janitorial jobs. Mm. We were um, painting apartments uh, as another source of income and paying seminary bills. Mm. And we weren't giving anything because we're going to seminary. We're preparing for ministry. And one of the profiles where Christians robbed God was a seminary family. And God just pierced our heart. Mm. And we repented. I, I want to make two comments before we move on. The Holy Spirit used that because when it's generic, it's kind of like, yeah, those terrible people mm. who don't respond and don't get it. And it was you didn't use our names, but you could have. I was thinking of you. Uh, no, you I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's other messages where he... He was preaching in the North one time and talking about resolving conflict. And he says, you got a problem with Stu, you talk to Stu. He says, you got a problem, you know, with someone else, you talk to them. You got a problem with Alan, take a number. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting in the front row. <laughs> You've always been kind to me. <laughs> but the Lord called us out not only to repent, but to the joy mm. of showing up. Mm. And here's the other thing that happened, Randy. I don't know if I've ever shared this with you. Uh, truly, I mean, the Holy Spirit just set us free that day. And we turned, and we've not returned to that. But part of that process was not just generic, man, we ought to think about this. We actually went and met with a Christian brother mm. who, who honors Jesus in noble ways, and we literally put all of our bills mm -hmm. out because we were in debt. We were in debt, and this brother helped us take the message we had heard and brought it home to our actual finances, and he says, we put the king first and foremost, mm -hmm. and we obeyed our way out of debt because mm. wow. we, we had more bills than we had money. And so we weren't giving, mm. but God led us to repent, and he gave us joy, and he, and he took us out of mm. the debt, and the joy has continued. Mm. 
Wow, thanks for sharing that. Uh, and I think that's powerful because, you know, sometimes you think people who are up front either don't struggle or they don't share their struggles. And every time somebody's transparent like that up front, I, I think it's a great help to all of us. And, you know, I would say that there are many people in many different circumstances, some sitting here right now, that are thinking, I'd really like to share. I love the idea of giving. I guess I even feel like I should give, but how can I? And I would just, given my circumstances, ju but just remember, in most cases, we've had something to do with the circumstances we're in. We've made choices, and lots of times in this culture, we just look around us, and it's all we see. You gotta have more, you gotta spend more, you gotta do more. And then pretty soon, we're out of money and we're you going know, actually, into debt. You know, actually, Randy, what today. happened was, is most of the choices that got us into debt were what were reasonable choices. Theta's birthday was coming. Got to get her a gift. Yeah. I didn't have the money, so we used credit card. There would be other reasonable choices by right. American standards, and, and we ignored the Holy Spirit's prompting right into a, a mound of debt. And the other thing that was really cool is once we repented, and we began our journey both in enjoying and obeying him and getting out of debt. No one stepped in or stepped up and said, we'll take care of that for you. Yeah. Which was really good. Yeah. Because we wouldn't have won it. Yeah. That's good. I think when we own up to, uh, clearly as, as Alan and Theta did, um, to the, the choices that we've made. And then just look and lay it all out. And that's a great thing to do. Because remember, it all belongs to God. And so shouldn't we know what we're doing with what belongs to God as his money manager? And we look at this and we look at this and go, how often? Nancy and I go out to eat. We love to go out to eat, okay? So I'm not against going out to eat. But you look at it and you go, how much money would you guess that you're spending on going out to eat? How much uh, a month on Starbucks? Which is sometimes called four bucks. <laughs> Because that's, <laughs> oh, that's, that's the cheap one. That's what a venti okay. latte is going to just about going to cost you. So, um, all right. Well, if you go, and there are quite a few people who go daily. And so you just, okay, if you just took that, and if you multiplied four, you got a venti latte, and it's close to four, not quite, four times 30, is that 120 dollars a month. Now, if a person was get, say, okay, guess how much I'm really spending uh, on Starbucks. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I go to Starbucks a lot. I might be spending $20, $30 a month. But no, it's like for the, you know, what I'm talking about, if you, if you go daily, um, it's a lot more than that. So right there, if I went once a week, Instead of once a month, I'd have $100 more per month available for what? How about to give? If, I, if we didn't go out to eat as much or we went to more reasonably priced places when we do, if we didn't have cable and it might help us in some other ways to not have cable, if we didn't have this, we didn't have this, how many computers do we need? Uh, and you're talking about a guy that has, I mean, I'm a guy who has several, okay? So I'm not against electronics and, you know, don't, don't get me wrong on these things. But what I'm saying is all of us have things in our lives that we can look at when we lay it out. And if I'm truly saying I can't afford to give, I remember a discussion with somebody at Good Shepherd years ago, we were in a small group. Bible study, and they said, and uh, a sermon series was going on about giving. I, I wasn't doing the preaching. Somebody else was. But we were talking about it in a small group. And they, they said, I, you know, we'd love to, but we just can't afford to give. And then I just took them aside afterwards, and I said, your car, the new car you're driving, okay, can you just calculate that in terms of if you were, if you had bought a decent used vehicle instead of that new one, what, what difference would it make and how much money? 
but so you could afford to spend that money on the new car, but you can't afford to give anything to church or to missions. Does that even make sense? And then I said to him, he had a good job. I said to him, if you got a 10% pay cut, would you starve to death? He says, oh, no, no, I, I would. You know, well, we could make it on the 90%. You've just said the words. And here's the thing. That's without taking into account God being pleased and God making the fruit so it doesn't cast the vine and maybe making the washing machine last another 10 years or whatever it is. God has... Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've given, you've really stretched yourself. You feel like maybe you've given not just according to your ability, but maybe you, beyond your ability. Lord, it's up to you now. Yeah, I don't want to be irresponsible, but... And then you've seen amazing things happen. And I'm not just talking about checks that come in the mail, though sometimes it is that way. But expenses that I don't... Often we're thinking, I don't know where the money went. When you're a giver, you often don't know where the money came from. And by the way, Haggai chapter 1, which I'm just going to turn to right now, is a passage that is extremely uh, relevant to this very thing we're talking about. Haggai chapter 1, uh, verse 2 uh, start there. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. And it's talking about the building of the temple. Rebuilding of the temple. And then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is, verse 4, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses? Paneled houses were a big deal in those days. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house the house of God remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. We're not talking here about a building project. Yes, sometimes the church has a building project. We've got one right now. But that's, that's not the purpose of this looking at this passage because it has to do with the building. It's how, it has to do with the work of God. The work of God that includes missions. The work of God that includes all of these things and what's going on at the local church. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, verse 6, but you have harvested little. Wow. Why? You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it, it just disappears. Have you ever felt that way? Then give heed to your ways. Give careful thought, verse 7, to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house. Not a house. The house. The house of God. Again, don't think primarily in terms of building projects. Do the work of God. Make it about the kingdom of God, the house of God, not your house, not your kingdom, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. And then, practically, in our lives, verse 9, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home and kept for yourself instead of giving it to me, what you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew. In other words, there are reasons why there's never enough money. The people that I know who are regular givers to the Lord and who give to him of the first fruits, not the last fruits, not what's left at the end of the month, but right off the top, first and foremost, I do my giving to God. Those people rarely are saying to themselves, what happened? There's never enough. Don't you want God on your team as you live your life and manage his money? 
Some people say, I'm going to wait till I get out of debt, and then I'll start giving. Once again, do not hold your breath. God says, I will honor you, but first you have to trust me. What I just said is not health and wealth gospel. Health and wealth gospel is God will always give you more and more so that you can always be richer and richer and keep more and more. That's health and wealth gospel. God is saying, I will provide for you. Trust me. Test me in this. Not just in the tithe, but in the free will offerings. Test me in this and see what I will do. Let me wrap up our time. Uh, we're going to, in a moment, have 30 minutes off, and there's going to be some food and refreshments out there for you. Let me clarify a few things. Um, these various books, we have six different books um, related to this weekend's conference that Randy has written. Uh, all of them are $5, which is way less than the normal cost in any bookstore. So they're available to you, but I want to feature a couple of things. All of those are $5. Uh, dollars. And then r there's a book that Randy just recently wrote entitled Hand in Hand, The Beauty of God's Sovereignty and, and Meaningful Human Choice. Um, there's a, and then there's a CD set of uh, managing God's money, which is we're going to get into that a little bit in the, in the final session. These are $10, but uh, Randy reads these books on these CDs. So as you're in the car or at home, uh, you can go through these valuable biblical tools while Randy's reading them for you. Let me pray for us, and then we'll be back at 1045. Father, you have made us to desire life, and there's only life in Jesus' name. Mm. Our flesh, the world, and the enemy are constantly haranguing us with needing to decide for ourselves what will give us a sense of peace, and ease and mm. comfort and meaning and they're all lies mm. and here Jesus is comes and says follow me seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you father continue to speak into our hearts and give us the joy and the mm. courage to actually follow Jesus in the real stuff of life so that we can have his joy in the real stuff of life. We pray in his name. Amen. See you in a few minutes. Randy is available.